Welcome to the Exam Room Live, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hello, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this, I promise you, is the healthiest half hour that you will spend anywhere today. So we appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube as we try to take your sports nutrition IQ to the next level here on the program today. Because indeed, today's show is all about nutrition and performance. Performance, whether it's on the court or at the track or on the field or really anywhere else. The fact of the matter is that plant-based athletes are growing in numbers and they are dominating their sports. Let me throw out a couple of names at you. A few names, matter of fact. Novak Djokovic, right? Lewis Hamilton, Venus Williams, Kyrie Irving. What do they all have in common? They are all eating a plant-based diet and they are all thriving. But how? How are they able to do that? How are they getting their protein without loading up on steak, without loading up on chicken? And how are they supposedly doing a body good without milk? Well, we're going to find out here today. We're going to crack the secret to their championship sauce. And to help us get that recipe are two gentlemen who know an awful lot about that. They are the authors of the new book, The Plant-Based Athlete, already a bestseller on Amazon. It is tearing up the charts. It is a phenomenal read. And why? Because not only are they experts in this area, but they put into practice what they preach because they are plant-based athletes themselves. Matt Frazier is here, as is Robert Cheek, and they are here to answer your questions about plant-based nutrition for athletes. So if there is something that you have on your mind that you would like to ask these two guys that you see on the screen with me right now, go ahead and post that in the comments or in the chat box. We will get to as many questions as we possibly can today. And if you'd like to hit us up on the Twitter, you can do that as well at Chuck Carroll WLC with the hashtag exam room live. Robert and Matt, how are you guys doing? We are great. Yeah, great, Chuck. Thanks for having thanks, us. Thanks for having us, Chuck. Really appreciate the opportunity today. And congratulations on the release of the book, man. This is uh, truly a, a game changer, as it says right on the cover of the jacket, man. This is uh, phenomenal stuff. Yeah, thank you. This has been a long time coming. This has been years in the making. And speaking of Game Changers, it features a number of people from the Game Changers, including James Wilkes, who created the Game Changers. He's featured in the book, Dotsie Bausch, Scott Jurek, and Rip Esselstyn, as well as dozens and dozens of other elite plant-based athletes, including world champions, record holders, and Olympians. And it has been tearing up the charts, even sold out in Canada, which we're kind of bummed about, uh, <laughs> hoping to get those, that replenished ASAP. But it's been a really, really exciting ride, Chuck. And, you know, for me, doing this for a quarter century, uh, you know, I couldn't be happier. And Matt, you, you just heard Robert mention uh, Dotsie Bausch's name. I mean, so now we've got the Olympics coming up in just a few weeks. You got to figure like this summer, more than any other Olympics previously, you're going to have more vegan athletes than ever, right? I mean, if you just look at the trends, I actually don't know the specifics of, of any that have, that have qualified and things yet. And I don't even know if those, those uh, you know, who's made it is set yet. Uh, but, uh, absolutely. I mean, the trend is just every year there are more and more and, and every year at a higher and higher level, we're, we're hearing, uh, you know, the latest vegan athletes come out of the woodwork. So, uh, it's an exciting time for sure. I think this book is going to be a part of, uh, of making it even better for the next Olympics actually. <laughs> And as the questions start to come in, Robert, let me ask you, you posted a picture on your Instagram uh, recently that showed you as a young man, you know, kind of on the slim side, very slim. Uh, and then I'm looking at you today. You, I mean, you got some muscles, my man, and you're doing all of this powered by plants. When you have that conversation with people and you know, they're like, well, what do you eat to bulk up, man? And you're like, well, it's not steak. It's not chicken. It's a completely plant based diet. Like what kind of reaction are you still getting from people? Yeah, you know, it's been a while. It's been a long road. You know, I, I have a different, uh, you know, journey than you, of course. Um, and I've, you know, I've put on 100 pounds. You know, I've, I've gone from 120 pounds to 220 pounds on a plant-based diet. And so I've, I've told that story. You know, I've put that protein question to rest individually and along with many, many of my colleagues, many of whom are featured in the plant-based athlete. And so the question about protein or, or, or how I get it or, or where I get adequate protein it's a little less frequent these days because I've just done it for so long. You know, I've been a champion bodybuilder. Even when I retired from bodybuilding, uh, weighing at the time 195 pounds, I got all the way back down to 165 and, and ran some half marathons and 5Ks and just pursued running again. And then I got back into weightlifting and built all the way back up from 165 pounds to then 220 pounds, showing again unequivocally that you can build muscle on a plant-based diet and you can get all the protein that you need on a plant-based diet. And, and it's not, it's not 
the foods that you might think. I'm not loading up on protein powders. In fact, I haven't had any protein powders in a decade. I'm not eating copious amounts of tofu, just blocks at a time. It's not that, it's complex carbohydrates which have the amino acids, the building blocks of protein in them. You think about beans and legumes and people think, well, that's a protein food, right? Well, it's mostly carbohydrate, but it's got a decent amount of protein in it. And it's, it's all the food, you know, it's the, it's the oats, it's the potatoes, it's the rice, the lentils, the beans, the leafy greens, the broccoli, the yams, sweet potatoes. It's, it's all of that. And there's some nut butters in there. There's some nuts and seeds in there. There's some tofu in there, but it's predominantly, at least for me, a 70% calorie intake coming from complex carbohydrates. And yes, even at over 200 pounds, which I've maintained for more than half a decade, I still get all the protein I need from plants. You know, I never thought I would crown a healthy weight gain champion, but I'm going to go <laughs> ahead and give you that title here today. Um, Matt, let Thank me you. ask you, man, like how, how is this fueling your performance? So I got onto this uh, in 2009. I was, I was trying to qualify for the Boston Marathon and uh, had taken 90 minutes off my first marathon time, <laughs> needed to get 10 minutes more off uh, to get into Boston, run this 310 mar- three hours, 10 minutes marathon, about a 715 uh, minute per mile pace. And you know, I was at the point, like when you take 90 minutes off your time, it's not like the, the last 10 minutes are going to come very easily. So I didn't know what I was going to do, uh, but I did know that I wanted to become vegetarian. I didn't know about vegan or anything back then. I uh, didn't even know it was a thing, but I knew for personal ethical reasons, I wanted to become vegetarian. So uh, I decided I was going to give that a try. And I didn't know what would happen with the, with the running, with the Boston Marathon journey. And so I looked around for some information to try to make sure I could make this work. And I couldn't find anything. So I decided that I would start this site called No Meat Athlete about it, just to really share my experience, share the experiment that I was basically running on myself. Uh, and, and hopefully, you know, people could learn something from it in the process, whether it worked or didn't. Well, to my great surprise, because like I said, it was not a performance decision. Uh, it worked exceedingly well. And just six months after I went vegetarian, I took those final 10 minutes off my marathon, got myself into the Boston Marathon with a time of 309.59. And, uh, you know, never looked back from there. I, I started talking about how this had worked so well, the things I was doing. I met people like Robert, Brendan Brazier, Scott Jurek, who's just a legendary ultra runner. I mean, not, not just legendary vegan ultra runner, runner but legendary ultra runner, period. Uh, learned that, that some of these people were, I mean, these guys were completely vegan. And some of them said this was why they performed so well. So I said, okay, well then, then I'm in. And I transitioned to vegan, got into ultra, ultra marathon running uh, a bunch of 50 milers and even a hundred miler, uh, completely hundred percent vegan at this point. And, uh, it's just been an amazing journey. So here I am, you know, that was all like eight years ago. I've been in all different kinds of fitness since then still some running, but not as much focus on any one big race or anything. Uh, but man, as far as, as far as I can tell from, from personal experience, plant-based diet and endurance running triathlon, cycling, swimming, they're, they're just a perfect match for each other. Uh, and what actually what the writing of this book taught me was that the same is true for strength sports, uh, for, for the powerlifting, and there are Olympic powerlifters for boxers, fighters, MMA fighters, uh, power, sorry, I mentioned powerlifters, but, but strong men, strong women, there are people making this diet work in all different kinds of sports. It's not just the endurance sports like I had personal experience in. So that has been so eye opening uh, and so exciting to work with Robert and, uh, and be, be telling those stories, because I think that adds a whole lot to uh, the story that all of us are telling about a plant-based diet. It's not just for people who are, who are looking to lean out and run a long way carrying not much weight, but people who want to bulk up even uh, are, are doing it with a plant-based diet. And many are doing plant-based for that reason. So it's amazing what this diet can do. Absolutely. And you can pick up a copy of the book. We've uh, dropped a link to order your copy right now. It's in the show description, or if you're listening to the podcast, it's in the episode notes. So go ahead and scroll down and click on that right now, pick up your copy. But gentlemen, ordinarily we call this the doctor's mailbag, but today we're going to call this the plant-based athlete mailbag. And let's go ahead and open that up and answer some questions because we're getting a ton pouring in already. Let's you guys ready? All let's right. Do it. Hey. All right. So Matt, I'm going to you for uh, this one. Uh, it comes to us from a runner. Natalie, she is a huge fan of both of yours. Uh, she wants to know, what foods do you recommend to keep a vegan runner going for five to six miles? Five to six miles. So that distance, that distance is going to take most runners uh, somewhere in the one hour range, the 45 minutes to one hour range. Uh, you know, some people might take an hour and 10 minutes for the most part, you're not necessarily going to need to eat anything during that time, uh, possibly some water if it's very hot. Um, but you actually don't need energy. Like you, as long as you've fueled properly ahead of time, and this is where I'll focus in this answer, uh, as long as you've done that, you can store enough glycogen to get you through even a pretty intense five or six mile run. 
Um, it's once you get over about an hour and a half, which gets into half marathon territory for uh, the fastest of us and, and, you know, eight, nine miles for, for those who are more average. Um, so, you know, you don't necessarily need anything. If you want something, I would, I'd say go with a module date, like really one module date should be plenty. Eat it halfway through your five or six mile run. Uh, dates to me are wonderful. They're like nature's energy gel. They're full of glucose. Each one has about 15 grams of sugar in it. Uh, but, but the fiber also that's going to prevent that crazy blood sugar spike. So it'll give you really, really quick energy, uh, without, without the downsides of, of things like processed energy gels. Uh, so I'd, I'd go with that, but more importantly, I would work on ahead of time. What do you eat ahead of time? Eat some fruit, you know, an hour ahead of time. If it's, if it's much closer than that, go right with the dates or even some fruit juice if you want. Um, but, but you know, it's more about just kind of making sure you have the stuff in your system to go, uh, to make that distance. And honestly, I think if you can do it without taking in more fuel during the distance, uh, you'll be training your body to become a little bit more fat adapted, which is training your body to, to rely on the glycogen it's storing. And then if it does run low on that, it'll start burning fat for fuel. Um, and, and that's, that's a good thing. Or honestly, in the, as you get more better at this, um, your body will, will burn fat first. And that's, that's really the best of best of all worlds. Oh, those medjool dates, they are tasty, aren't they? But uh, they are. I'm assuming though, like you, you would recommend a pitted date for when you're out on the run, right? No surprises when you bite down. Absolutely. And some people actually uh, pop out the pit and stick it like a Brazil nut in there, which, which will get you a little bit closer to this, this uh, four to one ratio of carbohydrate to protein that people like, uh, not to mention give you a little bit different texture. Uh, some people don't love the, the texture of date. So that's a, that's a pro tip for you. Absolutely. File that one away, my friends. Uh, all, right, all right, Robert, we are coming to you for this one. Uh, this is right up your alley. Uh, Instagram viewer wants to know, how do we get enough calories? My husband's non-vegan workout coach told him to bulk up. Love it, Chuck. I've had this question for the last two decades that I've been doing this as a vegan bodybuilder. So here's the thing. So you have to understand calorie density, right? So animal foods are very calorie dense, but nutrient poor. Uh, and plant-based foods are very, very nutrient dense, but oftentimes calorie poor, except for the nuts and seeds and nut butters and oils. And those in large quantities certainly aren't the, the best foods, especially oils, which we try to avoid. So what you have to understand are a few things. And I'll try to break it down here in a very clear and concise way. And I, and I hope this is really a great take home message. First of all, you have to know how many calories you're expending per day, because how do you know if you're trying to bulk up what you need to consume to have a calorie surplus? in order to achieve that along with resistance weight training. So what you need to do is use something called the Harris Benedict calculator. It's a Harris Benedict equation that takes in your gender, age, height, weight, and very importantly, your activity level and tells you approximately how many calories you expend every day. And then if you want to bulk up, you need to eat in a, in a slight calorie surplus. So what that means is you need to track your calories over a period of time. I recommend doing it for a week or so because anyone can, can and try to be perfect for a day, but it's not really uh, represent you know representation of their their real true daily lifestyle over the course of weeks or, or or months. And so, track your daily intake of of nutrition and training uh, for about um, a week using MyFitnessPal or Chronometer or so. And so, if it turns out that you need about twenty five hundred calories a day in order to maintain weight, what you need to do is is eat a little bit more maybe an extra 300 calories per day. And that's not, and that's not super hard to do. You know, that's extra half of, you know, sweet potato or a couple extra bananas during the day or blueberries on your oatmeal and some walnuts on your oatmeal or an extra small bowl of lentil soup, something like that. It's not dramatic, but what it does is it allows this adaptation to happen. You accumulate that extra surplus over time. That's how we gain weight in general. Most of us just do it through junk food and we're not aware of it. We're consuming soda and candy and meat products and cheeses, and, and all of a sudden we, we gain weight over time. But you can do it a healthy way. You can bulk up a healthy way by focusing on primarily whole plant-based foods and eating in a slight calorie surplus. So even in this scenario, you're consuming an extra 300 calories per day, but that's over 2,000 per week and 8,000 to 9,000 per month. And you combine that with exercise and you can develop good quality muscle over time. And I've done it throughout my life. So many others have done it. And, and we've written about it in detail in our book, The Plant-Based Athlete as well. I do wanna mention one thing. It's very common that people will come from an omnivorous diet. Uh, let's say they're an athlete, maybe a football player, even a weightlifter, a strength athlete. Maybe they're consuming 3000 calories a day. And for whatever reason, for health, for the environment, for animal rights, they come to a plant-based diet and they start, they, they take out the meat, they take out the eggs, take out dairy, and they, they 
replace it with salads and fruits and all of this, which is super great, right? Nutrient dense, it's really healthy, has the greatest nutrients per calorie ratio, really healthy stuff, full of antioxidants, vitamins and minerals. But sometimes they go from this 3000 calorie diet down to a 2000 calorie diet. And they say, hey, why did I lose weight? Why do I have less energy? How come I'm not as strong as I used to be? Well, you cut out a third of your calories. Sure, you're getting tons of nutrition and that's great. But for a strength athlete, a power athlete, and like the question here, this person's uh, husband, I believe, wants to bulk up. You've got to respect the calorie intake versus expenditure ratio. And that is one of the things that is actually the most important because at the end of the day, Chuck, we're looking for control, right? We want control over our weight loss. We want control over our, our muscle gain. We want control over our health. We want control over our outcomes. And this is one way to do it by truly understanding calorie density, nutrient density, calorie expenditure to intake ratio and setting yourself up for success. That's how we do it with, with weight loss. That's how we do it with weight gain, or in this case, you know, hopefully good quality muscle gain. And, and we have far more details on that in the book, including scenarios like that, including my story of trying to get bigger and stronger and, and failing epically until I realized that I had to consume a calorie surplus, make it from good quality sources, be consistent, allow adaptation to happen over time. And then you see results as a byproduct of that. Let me throw a scenario at you, right? Somebody who is first now adopting that, that healthy whole food plant-based diet, and they're eating more than they ever have because it's nutritionally dense, but not necessarily calorically dense. And so right. they're still trying to bulk up, right? Would you recommend then adding perhaps a smoothie in there as an easy way to get some extra calories as opposed to trying to squeeze in that extra sweet potato or a couple bananas? Sure. That's an effective way. It, it depends on, on what fits your lifestyle and your schedule and your routine and your preferences. So you can totally do something like a smoothie. You can, or you can add things to a salad like walnuts or chickpeas or cashews or whatever it is that's going to be really calorie dense. Um, you could, uh, yeah, you could, you could use soups, you know, it's consumed more, more in a liquid, but put in some extra calorie dense foods, maybe some different types of beans and some grains uh, in there into that soup and make that a little bit more calorie rich. So there's lots of ways to do it. And like I said, even a topping on a meal you already have, like oatmeal, put something else on there, or a salad or pasta or a, a, a dish of any type, you can always just add a little bit more. And if it's coming from good healthy sources, then you're, you're on the right track. All right, Matt, let's come over to you. This is a good question about drinks, okay? So we, we just heard soda uh, during the last question, right? So a lot of people think that Gatorade is the drink of choice when you go to the gym or you're playing a pickup basketball game. This viewer on Instagram wants to know what drink should athletes be consuming when they're at the gym or on a long distance run? Yeah, so that is absolutely right. Uh, people do think that Gatorade is the drink of choice. And I mean, it, it will do the job when you need it to, if that's all you've got. Um, like say you're running a marathon and, and Gatorade is the sponsor and that's what they have uh, at the aid stations, then, you know, it, it's going to do the job of giving sugar to your to your body, which will turn into glycogen and that will be converted into energy for you to keep running. Um, so it's not like it won't work. It's just not really a healthy choice. And for me, it's not the most effective choice either. Uh, the problem with Gatorade is it's mostly fructose. And for whatever reason, and, and a lot of people, that just doesn't digest all that well. Uh, and so for me, if I drink Gatorade, and I used to do this plenty, uh, if I just drink that for, say, the first 20 miles, you know, if I try to make that my, my marathon fuel, um, then 20 miles in, the thought of drinking any more sugar, touching any more sugar, will just be revolting. It's just something about taking in that much, the amount that you need to take, because you've got to take in 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour to keep that running going. Um, so you've got to take in a lot but you're just so sick of it. Your taste buds, something about your stomach. It's just something about that uh, never sits well with me. And, and the same is true for a lot of people. So when I had success with a drink, it was in when I did my hundred mile race, I had to find one that really worked well. And uh, Heed is a product by Hammer Nutrition and it's vegan. And that worked really well for me. I was able to drink it the entire time without issues. Um, it's still not like the, the most natural choice you can make. And there's a trade off here. Like it's like the question is, do you want the very best possible performance or do you want the thing that if you are using it day in, day out during your training, or like you said, going to the gym, um, not just on the rare race day. Uh, and that's usually the case because if, even if it is a race, you need to usually use it in your training so you can pre prepare. Um, if you want something that's kind of going to also support your body just for long-term health, which like I said, I, I can admit there's a trade-off. It's not necessarily the most effective thing for race day. Cause there are certain things that are made for race day that have 
that have, you know, no fiber, lots of sugar. And that's what your body needs at that point. It's just not the healthiest choice, but you can do like uh, a sort of a natural sports drink. One of my favorite easy ways to do it is take fruit juice, one part fruit juice, one part water. So maybe eight ounces of each to make 16 ounces. Uh, it waters down your fruit juice a little bit, then put in a little pinch of salt, uh, something like less than a quarter teaspoon, an eighth of a teaspoon, maybe that'll, that'll give you some electrolyte replacement. Uh, that's a really nice, just quick on the go sports drink. And to me, it's a million times better than something processed, something that comes from a powder, uh, that's in a big plastic tub. Uh, so that's, that's a much better day in day out solution. You can also make like data aid, which is, which is basically the similar ingredients it's dates, water, and salt, and maybe you know, people add different flavors, lemon zest or whatever they want um, to add something different to that. Brendan Brazier will put like coconut oil even into that, uh, which depending on your blender may or may not emulsify all that well, but you know, you can, you can experiment and just look up Datorade, which is obviously a, a play on Gatorade. Um, and you'll, you'll find lots and lots of homemade sports drink recipes like that, including there are several at nomadathlete.com, my website. Um, so that's, that's probably, you know, the best drink choice if you're gonna, if you're gonna be relying on drinks. Um, and then also, you know, people, these, it seems to me that it's sort of become more in fashion to drink your, your water and your electrolytes. And so like just a pure electrolyte drink that doesn't have sugar in it. Um, and again, when I say sugar in this context, I'm, it's, it's a good thing. It's not, it's not the sugar that's, that's, uh, you know, part of your normal daily diet. It's, it's here to get you through this process. So, um, you can, you can make a drink that has no calories in it, just electrolytes or very few calories, and then take something else like a medjool date. Um, or whatever, whatever it is that you, whole fruit, if you want, bananas are great. Uh, lots of those things can, can help get you through something. But like I said before, to the previous question, if you're not going for an hour and a half or, or getting near it, um, you likely don't need very much to, to keep you going. And so many people make the mistake. They see the advertisements and they assume that Gatorade and things like it are a health drink and that that's a natural accompaniment to your workout that like, if you're doing a workout, it must be accompanied by this Gatorade. But so many times when people do that, even on easy workouts, like just kind of routine aerobic cardio, where they're going at a, at a moderate to light intensity or moderate even to heavy intensity, but just not, not really that hard where you're really burning too much glycogen, um, you don't need to be sipping Gatorade that entire time. And in fact, you're, you're probably doing yourself a disservice by putting back in the very calories that you're there to burn. So some of this depends on your goals, of course, whether you're trying to put on weight, you know, establish a caloric surplus or deficit like Robert was talking about earlier. Uh, but I would first ask that, do I actually need anything during my workout? Uh, but if you do, then, then those kind of drinks are, are the ones I would I'd think about. Yeah. And let me add to that. Back in the day, I used to want to be like Mike, right? Michael Jordan. And I would drink Gatorade for days. I never got anywhere close to being able to dunk the ball. I could barely touch the bottom of the net, man. So I'm just saying, uh, I'm, I'm just saying, um, Matt, let me stick with you here. Uh, this is a question about, uh, eating and running. Natalie has a follow-up from her previous question. Do you eat before or after you go for the run? The answer is both depending on your goals. Uh, so like I said earlier, I suggested that like, make sure you eat food before this run instead of eating during it. Uh, but you don't even have to necessarily do that. You can, you can, and a lot of runners do this. They will work on training their body to become more fat adapted by not eating so much beforehand so that they don't have a full, you know, topped off tank of glycogen stores in their, in their muscles, uh, by the time they start running. And that means that your body from the beginning, is going to need to rely on fat. As long as you're running at a fairly low intensity, uh, this works and you'll be able to do this for a while. Um, and, and as a result, your body will actually get better at, at choosing to first burn through fat before it goes to carbohydrate. And it'll stay in the fat burning zone, even at higher and higher intensities of exercise before it shifts over to carbohydrate to support higher intensities. So it really depends on your goals. Likewise, if you're trying to lose fat, let's say you're trying to bulk up and you want to add muscle in the way Robert's talking about, but you also don't want to add fat or you even better, you want to lose fat while you're building muscle certainly a very high aim and not easy to do, but it can be done uh, as Robert will tell you. And one of the ways to do it is like, do your actual cardio, things like running, do those in a carb depleted state and don't actually eat that much. Don't eat immediately after either so that you're continuing to burn fat for the, the hour or so after that run. So like it can be done. And, and especially at the distances you're talking about where we're not talking about running 20 miles because that's, that's very difficult to do without carbohydrate. Uh, the, the fastest runners, the ones winning marathons, typically they're only drinking water. Many of them, they are, they are fat adapted enough that they can keep up that, whatever it is, four and a half minute mile pace for 26 miles without taking anything in. Plus they finish so fast that they actually can, can get it done in time before they need, need more refueling. Um, but if you're just looking at like, not trying to become fat adapted, not trying to necessarily lose fat, you're just trying to run and train the best you can 
so that you can build up to a certain race distance or something. You have a race goal and you want to get as many effective runs in uh, and you want to make effective adaptation adaptation after those runs, then you want to be eating before, during, and after your runs. Uh, the during part would be, would be optional and only as the runs get long enough to really require it. But I would definitely, if you, if you're working out in, in any kind of hard fashion and you're feeling like you're, you know, you really, you worked it and you're tired afterwards, I would eat something fairly soon after that. Uh, again, it's not going to be your optimal way of burning fat because you're immediately replacing stuff when your body might now start burning fat because it doesn't have anything. But if you're talking about giving your body the very best nutrients it can, all the resources it needs to begin the recovery process, then you should be eating pretty close to immediately after your run. Uh, within, within 15, 30 minutes, start eating a, a high carbohydrate thing. Uh, I'm a big fan of like something like rice with soy sauce because that puts back some salt as well. And you want some, honestly, some, some fairly simple carbohydrates at that point. And then an hour or two later, eat your big, uh, your big plant-based meal that includes some protein, but you know, a beans and rice, uh, a pasta dish, a burrito bowl, all kinds of different things, but you don't need to overthink it. But to me, it's focus on carbohydrate and quick digesting carbohydrate right after. And then an hour or two later, eat a big, normal plant-based meal. And don't forget the salad. Don't forget the vegetables, those micronutrients. That's what probably is responsible for the recovery benefits that so many people see on a plant-based diet. And so many people make the mistake of only focusing on their macros. They think, did I get my protein? Did I get my carbs? And how much fat did I get? And they ignore that, that so much of the benefit is what those are bringing to you with, in their micronutrient content. And the way you can boost that is, is, you know, eat like a vegan, right? Eat, eat a big salad, uh, as part of your meal an hour after you're done. So hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, I, that's a heck of a lot of information. I also think that I know for a fact that a good chunk of our audience is ultra clean when it comes to their eating, right? SOS, so no salt, no oil, no sugar. So we're hearing things about adding salt. We're hearing things like soy sauce. Um, it, fair to say, though, that the nutritional needs of somebody who is an active athlete are a little bit different from the person who is just kind of the day to day. Their exercise is maybe taking a walk around the block. Yes, absolutely fair to say, uh, especially when you talk about marathon and beyond, uh, there are different needs. But I will say there are people who would argue that, that and, and this is, this is kind of niche you know, getting into the nerd dumb. So I don't, I don't want to like endorse it because I, I haven't tried it myself. Uh, but like people, there are some people who say if you truly drink only to thirst, like if you're running these super long distances and you have the you know, restraint that you can carry a handheld bottle with you or whatever your water source and not just sort of drink it out of habit, but, but ask yourself every time, am I actually thirsty right now? There are people who argue that if you actually, and they have some science to, to prove it, that if you, I think you're kind of Tim Noakes, who's sort of the one who I've first heard say this, uh, that if you, if you truly drink to thirst, then your body is good enough at regulating, um, the, the balance of electrolytes that you actually don't need to add any additional salt to that. Uh, but other people will say, you're sweating a lot and with your sweat is going out lots and lots of salt more than probably you're taking in with your food. And if you're going to be out there for, for four hours, six hours, 10 hours, especially in the heat, uh, that you've just got to replace that salt or else you risk hyponatremia, which is a very dangerous thing, more dangerous than dehydration even, uh, in these types of events. So yeah, uh, for, for typical five, six mile runs and, and like this medium to hard intensity, but not too hard, you absolutely don't need to be thinking about putting salt back in your body. It's, it's like I said before, when you get into that longer distance and you're going to be sweating out a lot, like let's say a half marathon distance or anything where you're out there for an hour and a half to two hours and you're sweating, you got to think about things like salt. You got to think about things like, like sugar, um, potentially even processed. But like I said, dates are a really great, great source of, of whole food, uh, sugar that'll keep you going. Ooh, school is in session today, my friend. School is definitely in session. Uh, we have time for a few more before we close up the sports nutrition mailbag. And uh, I'm coming to you uh, for this one, Mr. Muscles. This is a question from <laughs> Natalia at 1214. Let's get real nerdy about this one. What okay. is a good macronutrient split for bodybuilding and body composition purposes? Yeah, this is going to shock you uh, because the bodybuilding world is obsessed with a high protein intake. They're obsessed with getting the sometimes the majority of their calories from protein or having a, a fairly even split with carbohydrates, perhaps. But I talk about and I have for years and years and years in my previous books, in my current book, and having talked with so many people about a high carbohydrate diet. I talk about a seven a, a 70, 15, 15 approach, right? So 70% of calories coming from carbohydrate, 15 from protein, 15 from fat. And that's even as a 200 pound bodybuilder eating 10 to 15% of my calories coming from protein, which is only about 70 to 90 grams, not the uh, 
you know, one, one gram per pound of body weight that so many people push, which would be for me over 200 grams of protein per day, uh, you know, weighing 210 pounds, that would be a whole lot. And in doing so, I would miss out on the incredible nutrient intake that I would get from complex carbohydrates that could be there instead, packed, filled with nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator, which is going to help increase uh, circulation and, and cell nutrition and, and blood flow throughout the body. And the anti-inflammatory properties and the antioxidants and the phytonutrients and, and very importantly, the fiber and even the water that's found in those complex carbohydrates. So I'm kind of having a shift here in the bodybuilding world, encouraging people to focus not only on your short, short term gains and success, which you certainly can achieve. And I've got plenty of uh, my own anecdotal before and after photos and many people who have read my work and, and followed that approach. But this long term health approach, like Matt was kind of alluding to, there's a difference oftentimes between health and performance, right? I mean, some of the great athletes out there, even these ultra runners where we've been talking about and, and some of these running questions, uh, they're not all that healthy uh, when they're out there on, on the on the race course, you know, going for 50 or 100 miles that inherently in itself, the physical activity is not all that healthy, but the, the massive amount of food and supplements and isolated nutrients consumed just to, to, to get them through that is not all that healthy either. And even the greatest of all time, you know, the goat, see that right behind me, the goat, uh, the greatest of all time, Scott Jurek uh, is, uh, is the first to say that like, yeah, this is not a super healthy approach, but this is what fuels a, an extreme athlete to reach these things. So in bodybuilding, what I'm really, really encouraging people to do is let's focus on, let's focus on the Andy score, right? Let's focus on the aggregate nutrient density index. Let's look at the most nutrients per calorie. And I can tell you from firsthand experience and from working with others that Chuck, I went from a, a vegan bodybuilding diet that was 5,000 calories a day, 300 grams of protein per day, tons of processed plant foods for years and was inspired by Forks Over Knives. I worked for Forks Over Knives. I helped release that film in 2011. I took doc Dr. T. Colin Campbell's plant-based nutrition course through Cornell University at the Center for Nutrition Studies. I, I now have a, a, a guest lecture that I give in that course, and I have for years. And that challenged this, this narrative about protein, this obsession about this isolated nutrient that dominates the bodybuilding and body composition and sports, strength sports world and I adopted a low protein approach or a moderate protein approach for athletic results and for long-term health. And I think that is really the most holistic approach we can take. So you can achieve your goals, right? You can achieve your muscle building goals. I got bigger and stronger than ever in my life following a lower calorie, lower protein approach, getting a much higher nutritional yield, just a greater return on investment. And yes, you know, uh, calorie uh, intake is going to, is going to matter as far as building mass, right? You know, the more calories you take in more likely the mass you're going to put on uh, muscle and fat. It's just the, the way it works, but there's also something to consuming a, a higher nutrient to calorie ratio. So in fewer calories, you can get greater results if that makes sense. So we're talking about decreasing inflammation and therefore uh, through all these plant-based whole foods, therefore speeding up recovery, therefore working out more often, getting a, getting a greater response uh, from your workouts, getting better, better recovery and repair of damaged muscle tissue, which happens as a result of resistance weight training. And so now you can adapt to this, uh, what is perhaps a lower calorie intake than you were used to, but getting a higher nutrient yield, Im improve that muscle repair process, improve that circulation, improve the energy that goes into the workouts, you get a better return from the workout, you're just, you're just more energetic, you can push harder, and you recover faster, so you can do it more often. So that's my that's my answer, uh, is that it can be as high as 70% uh, of your total calories coming from carbohydrates, and keep protein, you know, at a pretty modest level, we only need five to 10% of our calories coming from protein, even for athletes. And I've put that to the test for the last decade, I'm coming up on 10 years of this no supplements, no, or no protein supplements, I do use B12, but no protein supplements, no sports supplements, no emphasis on protein. And I'm just one of many I've, I've heard from other plant based athletes, including bodybuilders who are starting to incorporate this idea as well, because you can achieve your goals and have this longevity effect that we're all 
really in the back of our heads uh, searching for as well. This, this pursuit of happiness, I can feel well for longer. Therefore, I can do this sport that I love for longer too. Boys, we're in overtime, but there are, there are a couple more questions that I really want to get to. Are you okay to hang out for another five minutes or so? And, and we can do a lightning round too. Matt and I both have some long answers because we wrote a 350-page <laughs> book and we're passionate about it. But we have also can do some lightning rounds. So we can try to be as succinct <laughs> as possible. Oh, okay, okay. Lightning round. Then we're definitely going to squeeze in uh, more than two. But hold on. You may, want to, uh, you may want to expand on this one. All right. So we'll save the lightning round for after this one. Uh, Robert, I'm sticking with you. This is a question from Alexis. It came in at 1226. She's watching us right now on YouTube. And she wants to know, what is the difference between meat protein and plant protein? My family and friends always mention that I need meat protein, but I never lacked from protein. Right. That's a, that's a great question, actually, because there's really no fundamental difference. They're both amino acids. They're both they're both the amino acids, which, is, which are the building blocks of protein, and both contain all nine essential amino acids. Now, it's true that plant foods, certain plant foods may have lower amounts of certain amino acids, but we eat a whole variety. And therefore, throughout the day, we accumulate all of those different amino acids and, and it balances it's, it's itself out by eating just you know any kind of slight variety of food. Now there is a one fundamental difference though. So much animal protein comes with extra baggage, right? It comes with either a class one carcinogen, a class two A carcinogen. It comes with dietary cholesterol, which is only found in animal protein. It does not have fiber, which is only found in plants, which 97% of Americans don't get enough of. And it only has one 64th the amount of antioxidants that plant foods have and the, and, and how animal protein gets its antioxidants in the first place is because that protein, you know, that cow, that animal ate plants in the first place. So the, the, on, on a fundamental, like basic level, it's basically the same. It's amino acids, but you're getting so many more extra calories with the animal protein, including many unwanted calories that we don't need. And we know obesity is a problem here in America. It also has the cholesterol that can have uh, damaging effects on our arteries and on our overall health. And we also know that these foods can be carcinogenic. They can, they can be very, very problematic and they could also lead to uh, uh, cardiovascular issues, heart issues, um, and, and, are, and are very common degenerative diseases that as a Western society that we suffer from. So there's no shortcoming. I wanna make that clear. There's no shortcoming from plant-based protein. You just need to eat a variety of it. Uh, and, and with that protein from plants, you're getting all those extra vitamins minerals, those micronutrients, those antioxidants, the, the fiber and the water, the really, really important phytonutrients and, and nutritional components that are going to just lead to faster recovery. And that's really the thesis of this book, The Plant-Based Athlete that Matt and I wrote is that, Chuck, I want to tell you, every athlete we interviewed, 60 world-class plant-based athletes, they all reported the same thing. They, they have reduced inflammation, better recovery, and, and a longer mm -hmm. career as a result of consuming plants. So those are the differences between uh, animal and plant protein. I recommend leave the baggage behind and go with the plants to the original sources of protein, which are those amino acids that are found in plants. Oh, outstanding answer. All right. Now, you guys ready for the lightning round? Let's do it. Ready. All right, Matt, here we go. Starting with you. Do antioxidants help with inflammation after a workout? Antioxidants definitely help with oxidative stress. They help to reduce that, which is a, which is a byproduct of working out. I'm not actually sure if that's exactly the same mechanism as anti-inflammation, but anti-inflammation is a huge thing. And the anti-inflammatory compounds so present in plant foods, things like tart cherries, ginger, turmeric, uh, those are just the sort of superfood approaches. But it, it's antioxidant compounds are present throughout the plant-based diet and, and the opposite, pro-inflammatory compounds are, are prevalent throughout an omnivorous diet. Uh, they absolutely are, are a huge helper in, in uh, workout recovery and, and performance. Along the same lines, are there other specific foods that you would recommend for muscle recovery? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, leafy green vegetables uh, are, are fantastic. Uh, uh, beets, uh, anything, even you know, nuts and seeds that have great, great amino acids, building blocks of protein, um, alkaline forming, you know, hemp seeds, chia seeds, flax seeds, foods like that basically anything that's not processed. I mean, let's stay away from processed foods that can lead to inflammation. And let's take on these, these foods like the leafy greens, the beets, the cherries, the blueberries, the, uh, you know, the, the potatoes that can help, um, 
help speed up that recovery process. And also, you know, you want to replenish after workout, you want to replenish your glycogen stores that are burned through the carbohydrate fuel, you want to replenish that re replenish electrolytes, and get those amino acids to repair uh, those damaged muscle tissues as well. Matt, here's an interesting one. I'm not sure that uh, you guys got into this in your book. Maybe you did. Uh, what improves muscle flexibility in terms of nutrition? Ooh, uh, that's something I have not really thought about or heard about. I don't know if there are foods that increase flexibility. Certainly, uh, you know, good old fashioned stretching done in the right way. And it's sort of a dynamic fashion rather than static usually. And we do uh, cover that. We do cover that in the yeah, book. We have right. stretching and cool, uh, warm up and cool down and all that stuff. But there are, there are ways to stretch in ways that are less good to stretch. So uh, that will absolutely do it as well as just sort of general mobility, especially as we get older, Robert and I are both over 40. And to me, that's become uh, a really important factor as we think more about longevity and health span and wanting to keep doing stuff, being as active as we are uh, as we get older. I'm much more focused these days on mobility than I've been before. Uh, but I don't know about foods. I honestly don't know if there are foods that help with that or not. But let me, let me add one thing, though. Let me add one thing, though. It, but if you are chronically inflamed, if you're chronically inf inflamed from a, a post-workout induced soreness that you're not combating with nutrition, then it's hard to stretch those sore and damaged muscles. I know as someone who can, you know, press 120 pound dumbbells and decline bench press 300 pounds. And it, I am sore if I don't um, not only, you know, of course, stretch, but hydrate and use the, the proper anti-inflammatory foods to help that recovery process. And so if I'm, if I'm just chronically sore and chronically inflamed, then it's going to be really hard for me to stretch those muscles and which could then lead to a risk of injury or damaged muscles. And I've certainly gone through that myself. So I think there is a nutritional component there, but by combating that, that inflammation, and therefore you're more likely to want to do the things like stretching the muscles and um, hydrating them properly and allowing them to use those other methods of recovery. Question from all unholy quail. That's, that's a pretty funny name uh, on YouTube 1241. I checked my protein intake on a plant-based diet noticed I was getting 100 grams per day. Will my energy increase if I reduce the amount of protein to 40 to 50 grams per day? I, I think, I think it probably could, uh, you know, Matt chime in too, but I think it probably could because protein is our least efficient source of energy, right? So our preferred source is carbohydrate and then fat, which is our most concentrated source of energy. And protein is just the least uh, effective source of energy. It does have a impact on satiety and feeling full and satisfied and, you know, feeling like a heavy meal and all of that. But as far as energy and like, you know, usable energy that you can, that you get from eating mangoes and bananas and berries and, and potatoes and oats, that comes from the complex carbohydrates. And so I would suggest that, that the, yeah, if you want to increase your energy, um, you know, take some of that protein uh, intake down. I mean, hundred grams, that's more than I do. I don't know what your, your, your body weight is or what your sport is, but th that's a lot of protein. And that could be filled with high energy, complex carbohydrates, and also might be a little bit easier on digestion too, which could then, you know, save energy as a result, because, you know, that's, that's a really, uh, you know, energy intensive process to go through digestion too. The only thing I have to add is that like, it depends a lot on your weight, right? Typical body weight or typical recommendations for a 150 pound person, uh, are somewhere in that 45 to 55 gram, uh, you know, range. Uh, some more recent studies for plant-based athletes or sorry, for athletes in general, um, have suggested something like 70 to 80 grams for that amount of weight. So like, you know, 40, 50 may, may go a little bit lower than your body is, is optimal at a uh, hundred is probably higher than it needs. So I would, I would try reducing it. If, if something doesn't feel quite right at 40 to 50, then, then go up. This is for athletes. Of course, it's for active people, uh, not sedentary people. Uh, but like Robert said, I think when you get rid of protein, protein is not, not the preferred energy source. In fact, in fact, it's the least preferred energy source. Uh, but, but more than just that, more than the fact that you're replacing something it with something your body prefers, typically the carbohydrate sources, uh, are going to come with more, with more micronutrients. And I think that's where you're going to experience the energy benefits because you're getting more micronutrition in every calorie. Uh, so if you're, if you're currently using protein powder, for example, to get, uh, up to hundred grams, you replace that with actual whole food, some carbohydrates, some protein, uh, I think you're going to experience energy benefits as a result of just more micronutrients coming from, from whole foods. All right. Final two questions. There's some chatter right now in the chat room about maple syrup as an energy source. Somebody is wondering what your thoughts on it are. And then a Canadian chimed in and said, there's zero chance that I could ever give up maple <laughs> syrup. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to leave that statement at that, but that is an honest to goodness comment that's in there. Uh, so Matt, your thoughts on maple syrup as an energy source. Yeah, this is exactly the same trade-off that we've been discussing earlier. 
uh, it will work great as an energy source because it's going to reach your muscles fast because there's not so much fiber in there. So it's going to get quickly to your muscles. And that's a good thing in some context for some sports, some athletes. Uh, it's in some drink recipes. Like I told you earlier, look those up. You'll find some maple syrup in those. In fact, in my first book, I think I had a, a homemade sports drink recipe that had a teaspoon or two of maple syrup in there. Um, and that's to add some quick digesting sugar. So yes, it, it can help you. Uh, but if you want to be a little bit more mindful, if, if you're talking about everyday nutrition and you're in this for the long-term wellness more than the short-term performance, then I'd find a whole food source, eat that food a little bit earlier than when you need it and, uh, and get it that way instead. So it depends on your goals, but, uh, yes, viable energy source for sure. All right. And final question, uh, Robert, we're going to start with you, but I would love for both of you to chime in. This comes to us from kid lit class on Instagram says, uh, I'm halfway through the book and I'm loving it. What is your favorite recipe from the last chapter? Oh, that is a great question. Um, man, well, one of the really cool things is that for those that don't know, we interviewed 60 world-class athletes and the recipes in the book come directly from these athletes. So if you want to see what James Wilkes has for breakfast, it's there. Or Olympic gold medalist Megan Duhamel has as a, as a dessert, it's there. Or what 25-time champion Corinne Sutton has for breakfast, it's there. So uh, my favorite bounces around quite a bit, but I'm going to, I'm going to say two. I'm going to say, um, I think it's Corinne Sutton's acai bowl. And I'm going to say uh, my wife contributed this one, even though it's under my name, the summer pasta salad with artichoke hearts and tomatoes and, and uh, spinach. And it's a cold pasta salad that's super refreshing on a 95 degree day like we have here in Colorado this afternoon. Ooh, 95 in Colorado. My goodness. Uh, yep. Matt, if somebody's, <laughs> if somebody's in the final chapter, what recipe should they turn to? Yeah. So first reiterating Robert's point to me, that's one of the very coolest things about the book is you get like this direct access to these elite athletes, pro athletes, Olympian athletes, you know, exactly what they eat, like their favorite recipe that they could possibly contribute. They contributed it. So to me, that's, that's invaluable. I remember when Scott Jurek did that uh, back with his book in 2012 and I was an aspiring ultra runner and it was like, I had just found everything I would ever need a treasure trove with his 12 recipes that he gave, whatever. So I think it's such a great section. I love that the athletes did it. Um, my favorite ones I keep bouncing around too. We've done a bunch of these interviews and I keep changing them. Uh, Sonia Looney, world-class mountain biker submitted uh, like an Asian, uh, noodle dish that I think is great. And then I've been saying Robert's chickpeas curries or sorry, curried chickpeas, uh, cause chickpeas are such a good longevity food, <clears throat> turmeric, of course, in, in curry. And it just very, very good, healthy, wholesome meal. Um, but recently I've been saying rips big bowl. Cause that's the one people you'll know that from, from whole foods It's in his cereal box. Uh, and it, you know, it's, I don't know, it's not cheap. I don't know what it is. It's worth it, but it's not cheap. It's six, seven bucks or something. Uh, and my kids will devour it. So I am so pumped to actually have the recipe now. And it's even, it's even better. Like it's not just a shelf stable recipe. It's the actual real original fresh rips, big bowl recipe. Uh, so that's, that's one that I really like a lot. All right. Now here is the book that will give you that direct access right, right here. Okay. And you can pick up your copy on Amazon or at your local book retailer. We've gone ahead, by the way, in the show description, uh, we've included a link to the order it right now on Amazon. So all you need to do is click over and do that right now. Uh, gentlemen, you two have just been fantastic. I love the people also that you interviewed for the book. A lot of them have been on this show. Megan Duhamel, the last Olympics, she was our correspondent. I mean, just as funny and as witty and as smart as a tack. I mean, she's just fantastic. So I'm really glad that you guys got the opportunity to interact with her a little bit as well. And I'm sure that, you know, everything that she said in here and the recipe that she gave is absolutely delicious too. By the way, did you guys talk to her about the lengths that she went to to keep it vegan at the last Olympics? Like that was an incredible story she told me. She like at the, at the, just the food that they offered there? Yeah, the food that they offered and what she did to make sure that she had healthy food there, like shipping all of her food over hmm. ahead of time, like weeks ahead of time. Yeah, she didn't go into those kind of details. She talked about specific foods that helped her with her recovery and her performance and her journey and her you know undefeated streak one year as winning every single world championship that year, 2015, I think, and the eventual you know achievement of winning Olympic glory and with a gold medal and all that. But there, there are there are many such stories, Chuck, of of people, including some of these cyclists, 
who are, are, are competing in, in countries all around the world and, you know, in the Himalayan mountains and the Sahara desert and the things they go through to keep a plant-based diet going strong. Uh, farmers markets when they land in, in, in European countries and uh, or, or Asian countries and, and getting their, their supplies right there. Some of those stories, including from Christine Vardaros, which has a pretty funny one in the book, are, are in the book. And, and Matt and I have both certainly done that ourselves with our global travels. And it's, it's, it's again, it's the commitment that people make to, to dedicating their lives to being plant-based athletes and, and not making sacrifices and, uh, or, or compromises and knowing that you don't have to. And that's the beauty of it, Chuck, is that you don't have to. And yeah, you, there's some hoops you have to jump through sometimes and working with the Olympics or working in, in certain countries or certain parts of the world, but it's doable everywhere. And we have a completely global presence with the athletes that we interviewed for the book uh, from continents around the world. And, and, and we think it's, it's now more than ever, it's as practical uh, and, and possible for anyone to be a plant-based athlete. And we hope this is the tool that gets people started. Matt Frazier, Robert Cheek, The Plant-Based Athlete is the book. You guys are just the absolute best. Thank you so very much for going into overtime with us here on the exam room live today. So appreciative of your time. Oh, it was absolutely. our pleasure. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, everyone, thank for you, the Chuck. questions. Yeah, thank you for the platform today. Appreciate and you. Absolutely. And indeed, that is all the time that we have today. So I want to say thank you once again to my guests and also to you, my exam roomies, for asking so many wonderful questions. And for everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again soon. But until then, keep it plant-based. <laughs>